We are John and Ellie, the Barefoot Doctors. We lost our new Leopard 50 catamaran to fire, so we began our search for the perfect performance catamaran for selling us around the world. After four decades of selling experience, we are very clear about what we want. So join us as we explore new horizons, stretch the boundaries in yacht design, and build the ultimate catamaran. Jump on board for this adventure, and together, who knows what we can achieve? <laughs> because life is better barefoot. All right, guys, welcome back to another Barefoot Doctor Sailing episode. First off, we have to excuse our voices because we've been a little unwell, and um, so we're a little bit croaky, but the show must go on. But it's not a show, right? This it's is our It's our life. life. <laughs> John came up with a really great topic that a lot of people are interested in, which is about beaching the boat, the advantages and the disadvantages. Now, it, we are literally gobsmacked that there are so few boats that can beach for the amount of amazingness that you get from beaching boats. So that's what the topic is today. I'm just amazed at how few people actually realize how wonderful it is and the benefits that you get from having a shallow draft boat and the ability to beach. So it's a combination of those two things that makes it absolutely spectacular. There are monohulls with bilge keels and a lot of bigger boats that have six foot draft and can sit on their keels, which is great, but that you still don't have the advance of the shallow draft. So what we're gonna to do today is talk about why it's so beneficial and there are two main areas for this. One is a pure safety thing and the second one is a lifestyle benefit. We're also going to talk about how to do it and the concerns that other people have about beaching and I'll go through the solutions to these sort of issues. So okay what's the big deal you might ask and why is it a safety measure? That's a good question. So the benefit of having a shallow draft boat that you can take into shallow waters and beach means that you can escape away from storms, cyclones, rough water and put your boat up on the sand in complete protection from the wind and the waves while everybody else is out hanging on their anchor, being slopped about and having, to, having concerns about dragging their anchor. So for example, if you have a storm coming and you've got a shallow draft boat, you can take your boat right up close to the beach within in a meter of water or, or even right up nose to the beach, put your anchor in or tie yourself off to trees on the shoreline, put a stern anchor with the wind blowing off the, off the land, you're protected by whatever land you have, but you won't move because you're tied to trees and you're in shallow water, so you have absolutely flat water. The storm blows and we were in Brampton Island sitting on, uh, on the beach for three days while this 35 knot storm blew mm. its guts out and we had the most fantastic weekend. You did, The actually. wind was, we could hear the wind howling up high, but low down behind the palm trees, everything was comfortable. And we were floating for, you know, probably four hours of every tide, four hours of every 12 hours. That allows you a completely different perspective of being on your boat in a storm. Not only is it more comfortable, but it's also phenomenally safer because you will not drag when you're sitting on the sand because you can't drag. For the four to six hours that you're floating, you only have that amount of time to watch for anchor dragging. And because you're in so close to the beach anyway, in shallow water, you have much less risk of dragging. So the other safety feature is really about getting out of uh, trade winds or swells. So for example, sailing across the South Pacific, when you've got shallow draft, you can actually cross over reefs or go into completely protected atolls where there is no entry, but because you have shallow draft at high tide, you go over the top, you only need two foot or three foot of water you can get into the atoll then the tide goes out and the atoll itself protects you from all the swell okay and then the other aspects about shallow draft and being able to beach the boat it means that you can go up rivers and creeks and into mangroves so this is a phenomenal safety aspect as well tie yourself off to the trees and if the tide goes out and leaves you high and dry it doesn't matter obviously sometimes you won't dry out but Having the shallow draft allows you to get up the creeks and get into safer areas as well. When you've got a shallow draft boat and you make a navigational error, 
it usually doesn't matter. Once I bottomed out and had to wait for the tide to come in, the thing is, it doesn't matter. You know, you're not going to break your rudder. You, your boat is built for that. And also, if you're in a monohull, you'd be lying on your side looking very embarrassed. Whereas we sat back, made a cup of tea, had lunch. You and get the wine out <laughs> <laughs> or the beer or whatever your poison is. And you just sit there and, and wait for the time and know that you, you're perfectly safe. Honey, you can tell us about why do you love the beaching so much because this is lifestyle stuff. Let me count the ways. <laughs> I just love the idea of beaching because before I met John and sailed on his cat that he built which could beach and shallow draft two foot that's all the draft was, was two foot on his catamaran. I really didn't understand the benefits of beaching. And it felt a little bit weird at first because boats are supposed to be in the water, right? Once you get over that concept that, you know, the boats can actually beach on the sand, it's, it's amazing. I love it. There's so many places in the world that we have traveled that if we had had have had a boat that had shallow draft, we could have snuck right in close, close to the beach, even if it wasn't right up into the beach, but close to the shore in shallow draft. We could have just sat there and dropped our anchor, and even if it was crowded and there was heaps of boats around us, we could have navigated and got right to the front and be away from the crowd. It makes you feel like you've got like a secret pass or something. There's no restriction there. You can go over shallow atolls that have only got, you know, three feet under your bottom, places that you wouldn't normally even consider, and they're usually the places that are the most beautiful and picturesque places that you want to be. Having the, the shallow draft capacity and when you don't have to worry about beaching, it opens up so many more uh, anchorages and completely isolated from everybody else. Because all the other boats can't go in there, you're in there often by yourself and it is just spectacular. Words are hard to describe it. It is just perfect, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, we just sat there by ourselves and having complete privacy. So, especially a place like the Bahamas, there are so many anchorages and potential anchorages that you can go into if you don't have four and a half or six foot of draft. Uh, in terms of lifestyle, the other thing that's really good with shallow draft is, imagine you are approaching an anchorage and it's completely chock-a-block with boats. Um, all these boats are anchored usually in two meters of water or more. If you've got a shallow draft and you only need one meter, you drive straight past all of them and drop your anchor in front of them all, all by yourself or maybe with a few motorboats around you. It's just amazing how much more options of anchoring you have when you have shallow draft and you're not restricted by that, you know, four and a half to six feet of depth needed at low tide. And you're not restricted to stay out there with all the masses that don't seem to take into consideration your swinging anchor room. Everybody seems to just drop their anchor way too close. Anyway, that's a whole other story. We took our 50 leopards through the Bahamas and it's 1.5, 1.6 draft. And we bottomed out on the sand because on the charts, it showed that we should have had plenty of water under our keels. But in actual fact, the sh sand had shifted. So we actually bottomed out in a couple of places. But if you've got a boat that can beach, that takes away all that stress and drama because you think, oh, well, you know, if, if we, we beach, we beach. We'll sit we'll, down and wait till the tide we'll comes in. We'll wait till the tide comes in. So it takes away that anxiety, uh, which is just absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that always amazed us, that we would be sitting there in absolutely flat water and all our co-sailors were out being exposed to swell and waves and they were rocking around quite dramatically and we were in absolutely flat water. Just because we were in close or we were on the sand, the quality of your sleep when you're in a shallow draft boat, in shallow water, in flat protected water is infinitely priceless. better. Priceless. Yeah, <laughs> priceless because you will sleep well and then in the morning everybody else will say, oh my God, what, what a terrible a night. night, oh my. And we said, really? Yeah. yeah. So the other really nice thing about having a shallow draft boat that you can beach is you can just drive the boat forward straight up until the nose hits the beach and the, the dry sand is maybe one meter in front of you or maybe you're right there. So you just jump off the front of the boat and you're on the beach. And the difference with when your boat is designed to be able to sit on the sand, it doesn't matter if the tide goes out. For example, um, Outremers, they can do that. And a lot of these other boats, uh, HHs, I'm sure, they can uh, nose themselves up onto the beach, but they can't stay there because the tide goes out, their rudders press on the sand or hit the sand and they will break. So they don't have that option of staying there and sitting and drying out. You have to keep pulling the boat back to keep the rudders off the sand. Can I just say, we love our leopard 
45 and the Leopard 50 absolutely had, you know, it's got some really great features, but the one thing we missed out on having was the, the shallow draft and the ability to beach. Yeah, it, it was quite a, I shouldn't say shock to the system, it was quite a significant... Just a little bit. It was, it was a, little a shock bit. to the system. <laughs> you can say that because it was a little bit. It was a shock to the system. <laughs> and I suppose only when you lose it do you realise, you start, you know, thinking back and think, oh, that was so good. Yeah, and oh, look at that anchorage. We could have snuck right into that one and, know. you know, forget it. Yeah, you've got to stay outside. I, I'm really, really, really excited with the Portofino 52 that we'll have shallow draft and we can beach the boat, <laughs> yay! All right, guys, so there's actually two really important points that are a real asset when you can beach the boat. And the first one is that when you beach the boat, you've got under the bridge deck, you've got all that shade. So you can be in this absolute sweltering heat and you can sit under the bridge deck and you're in the cool, in the shade and then when the water goes out and the, the, the water comes in and the tide's in a little bit, you can wallow around in the shallows and just spend the entire day under the bridge deck. It's fantastic. I love it. So the second thing is that often there's something that's going on with the boat you just want to check that's under the waterline or close to the waterline and you can do this so easily when the boat's beached. We've cleaned the hulls, we've we, the, the royal we, have um, changed a prop and put a new prop on, uh, completely beached and out of the water. You know, cleaning the boat is much easier, scraping the hulls is much easier because you've got some traction from standing up or from kneeling, not having to try and tread water when you're doing it. Okay, so the other thing we've done is we've actually anti-failed on the beach. We've taken the necessary precautions to protect the environment, don't worry about that. It's, it's been great. Mind you, we've had to do it when the tide was going out and before the tide came in. And so we spent a whole weekend doing this and just making sure that it was dry enough. But that's the type of things you can do. You can do little bits and pieces on your boat when you can beach it. It's just amazing. Okay guys, now also I want to talk about the, dis or the potential disadvantages of beaching your boat. We've had lots of comments over the last few weeks and I'll go through a variety of different people's uh, concerns about beaching. One guy said he'd be worried that as, he, as the boat sat on the sand he'd have rocks or he'd damage the hulls. The thing is if you're actually doing this you put the boat where you want to beach it, you, the tide goes down very very slowly, you have plenty of time to step off the boat and walk around in knee deep water feeling with your feet or digging under the sand to make sure that there's no uh, rocks or anything or coral sticking through or even tree stumps sticking through the sand that you weren't aware of. So you have plenty of time to check and if there is a problem with the, that area not being suitable you simply walk, you don't need a motor the boat, you just push it, pull it with your arm uh, on a rope and push it to where the sand's better. So it's very easy to check the sand that you're going to sit on before you actually drop down. One of the other issues somebody raised was the fact that you can't run your engines when you're out of the water. How many hours a day do you plan to run your engines, guys? You know you're going to be in the water for four to six hours of every 12 hours. If you need to charge your batteries, you charge your batteries when you're in the water so that the water is there to circulate through the engines. When you're dried out, you just don't run your engines. Your batteries will usually always last more than that length of time. Okay, the other thing that I wanted to mention because it is important to be aware of is when you're dried out on the beach, you cannot use your toilets normally because if you see water flushing, there's no seawater to flush your toilets out. And if you're freshwater flushing, you don't want to flush your sewage onto the lovely white sand you're going to be walking around. Most boats now have holding tanks. Clearly, when you're dried out, use your holding tanks, guys, and then empty them in a few days when you're out in deeper water. The other thing that's important is when you're beached, and you're stepping up and down from the boat, your, your, your feet will get all sandy and you do not want to bring the sand up onto your boat. So before the tide goes out, what we do is we get a bucket, we fill it with seawater, or maybe two buckets, one on each transom, and put it there so that as you step up onto the boat, you rinse your feet, get the sand off it, and then step up onto the boat. So that's a So here's the boat sitting on the sand. This is a classic sort of sand mooring where we dry out. Our CQR is well buried in the, in the sand there in order to prevent dragging as the boat starts floating we put a stern anchor out so here is the stern anchor stern anchor holds the boat 
So as we start floating and the rudders lift up out the sand, there's not a lot of movement to put strain on the rudders. So the other thing that some people are unsure about is when you are going to beach your boat, how do you hang your boat on the sand? A lot's going to depend on where the wind is and if the sand is flat or if it's sloping. Typically you would sit your boat so it's facing into the wind because that way your natural ventilation of the boat flows through well and also the anchor holds you the best when it's held directly into the wind. If you have the stern to the wind, the stern anchor will hold you, but what you absolutely don't want to have is, is a fore and aft anchor and the wind blowing from the side because that puts an awful lot of strain on both anchors and often they won't hold if the wind's got any strength to it. So typically just face into the wind or face into the direction of the wind that you expect it's going to come. So for example, if you're in 10 or 15 knots and you know there's a 25 knot blow coming, you know, in a few hours time, put the boat facing the strong wind that's coming, not into what the wind's doing right now. Because then when the wind starts blowing its guts out, you have the anchor in the right position. From what I've said clearly, you're hearing that we use a stern anchor. I think that's a really good idea because what that does is it stops the boat from uh, drifting sideways, backwards and forwards as you're both um, landing down onto the sand, but also as you're lifting off. If your boat drifts a lot from side to side, there are a couple of possibilities. Obviously dragging sideways, you have the risk of the sand scraping your antifoul or scraping the paint on the bottom of your boat off. And also if there are any rocks or um, obstructions in the sand in that arc, then you're gonna hit them as you go sideways. Put a stern anchor out. This only needs to be done in, in the last foot or two feet of water as the tide's going out. Wait till the boat's almost beached, step off the back in you know knee-high water, walk your anchor out, push it in with your feet and then tighten it up. And that's easy and works very, very well. The other warning I'd say is if you're looking at it for a place to beach your boat, avoid any places where there is swell or waves coming onto the beach. And that's both now and expected. If you're trying to lift the boat off or land the boat down onto the sand while there's waves, those few minutes, half an hour or 45 minutes as the boat's settling or lifting off, you get this sort of bumping. Now it's not going to do your boat any harm, but I don't like doing it. I like to take off and land very smoothly. So, okay guys, what's really important when you're beaching your boat, now you've got to make sure that whatever height of tide you beach your boat to begin with, the tide the next day or the 12 hours later is going to be high enough to lift you off. It's very embarrassing if you go in at the top of the tide one day and the next day the tide is lower, you're going to be there for two weeks, guys. So, a bit embarrassing. So, don't do that. Check the tide times. Choose your hour that you're going to beach and that will determine whether you're on the beach for six hours, as in three hours out and three hours coming in, or whether it's nine hours if you, if you park the boat relatively high on the, on the top of the tide, then you'll have a lot of hours of of your four or five hours going out and four or five hours coming in. So that'll give you a lot of time on the beach, but you, when you do that, you do need to make absolutely sure that the tides are not getting smaller over the next few days. There is a way you can actually calculate exactly what height of tide you're gonna have at each hour, and there's a really simple way you can do this. It's called the rule of 12. So the rule of 12 is basically over the six hours, if you just imagine one, two, three coming in, three, two, one going out, and those are the proportions of the tide that flow in each hour. So for example, for simplicity, I'll say we're dealing with six meters of tide. That means in the first hour, there's gonna be half a meter tide, which is one twelfth of six. The next hour, you're gonna have two twelfths of six, which is one meter. And in the third hour of tide, you're gonna have a tidal movement of three twelfths, which is 1.5 meters. Then again, 1.5 meters for the fourth hour, one meter for the fifth hour, and half a meter for the sixth hour. So you can work out exactly how many meters the, of height you're gonna have at every single hour of the tide if you wanna be very careful to make sure that your boat will float off at the right time. That's also important if you're wanting to leave early, like 
Um, say for example, you've got to catch a, a, a tide, you don't want to be sitting high on the sand and discover you can only leave you know, four hours after you should because you were too high. So you can work out when the tide will come in to different points so you can control what time you float off relative to the tide and get away at the right time for your passage. And also obviously if you know the tides are reducing over the next few days, each day you can just pull the boat further back into the water so that you float off each time. Okay, now the other really important thing I want to talk about is specific places where beaching the boat is absolutely amazing. Honey, where's your favourite? Well, first is a little place called Hill Inlet in Australia, which is our favourite place. I think we've talked about it before. But it has the most amazing white pristine sand, so squeaky, clean and silica-like that it's just magic. You have to have shallow draft and you, you have to be do. able to beach the boat here. Yeah, and so. it's our favourite spot and you've got to wind your way through the, the shallows into kind of the back of the back of Whitehaven Beach and it is just the most magic spot. You know, crystal clear water um, and we drop the anchor and we nudge right up to the beach and then we dry out usually. So we're sitting there completely flat, it's 360 degrees protection, completely flat water, doesn't matter which direction the, the wind's coming from, the waters will be flat. The sand is so soft, you have natural jacuzzi there because <laughs> the sand great. is so light that it traps air and as you're lying in it or sitting in it, it all bubbles up past you. It's great, look at the look on his face as he's remembering Hill Inlet, which is our favourite place. But it's kind of like the Bahamas, but Australian style. In our part of the world, uh, the Whitsundays again, Brampton Island is the spectacular bay, Western Bay, which has got again 360 degrees protection. We've gone in there at night because we know the depth, so we just drive straight in and we really amaze people. Like we'd sail there at the end of a Friday, Friday work, get in there, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, sail straight past all of these anchored people straight into the shallows, drop the anchor, and in the morning we'd... Ta-da! <laughs> people say, how did you do that? Ah, it's a secret. So tell us about other favourite places. Other favourite places would be the Bahamas, definitely. Because there's so much sand. I mean, you've got the banks, but you've got these gorgeous islands everywhere that have got all this sand. And it would just be phenomenal to be able to beach the boat in those places. A lot of the, the anchorages and the, the bays are very, very shallow. And if you have a shallow draft boat and you consider the sand, then the, the number of days. anchorages you will have, <laughs> well, I reckon, will be increased about tenfold. Yeah. But wait! I just want to interrupt this important broadcast with an announcement. Well, it's not a really announcement. It's just an invitation for you guys. If you like what we do, hit the subscribe hit the like and the notification bell because it really helps our channel. Yeah. So other parts of the world? Well, of course, there's places like in the Pacific, there's um, lots of sandy places in the Pacific, you know, that have great um, flat sand and beaches and things like that, that you can nose right up to the sand and to the shore. Yeah, coral atolls where it's flat water because the coral breaks the, uh, the, the swell from the trade winds. And then inside you have these very protected little sandbanks or islands of all shapes and sizes. So if you have a shallow draft boat, you can go right up to the beach again or very into very shallow water and more frequently get in really protected water. Mm -hmm. The other major areas where shallow draft and beachability is important is the UK and the Atlantic coast of France because here you have very big tides. I've done a lot of sailing all the way around the UK as well. You have a lot of ports where the tide goes out and you, you're, all the boats are left high and dry. So you have a lot of bilge keelers there, but having a boat that you can sit on the sand or the mud safely and easily is a huge advantage. And you definitely have to have the water bucket ready if you're sitting on the mud. Yeah, you need to, you need to wash the mud off your feet <laughs> in those sort of situations because the mud comes up to about your knees. It's quite dramatic. Now, I don't know why more... Oh, I was just about to say that. Well, you, you go. Yes, there you go. No, you go. Well, I was just about to say, I am absolutely dumbfounded why other people haven't discovered the magic of shallow draft and, you know, beaching your boat. 
there are more that can't than there are that can. Very few can, yeah. And the advantages, as we've explained to you, far outweigh the disadvantages. And I just don't think people have been exposed to the possibility, because once you're exposed to the possibility, you don't want to go back. That's right. And I mean, there are so many people sailing the Florida coast and going to the Bahamas, but so few boats have that capacity. Bahamas is absolutely the most perfect place for this type of well, facility. You? I mean, come on, guys, <laughs> get force the force the manufacturers to build more boats of this type because your life will improve exponentially, dramatically, almost inconceivable. Why manufacturers don't? Of course, I know why they don't because they want to keep the costs down, and people aren't really privy to how fantastic a lifestyle this is to be able to beach your boat in shallow draft. So. While people aren't making a fuss about it or asking about it, the manufacturers aren't going to shift from, from the norm. From the status quo, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I suppose this comes back to what we discovered when we lost the Leopard 50. We said, okay, well, these are the things we want. Why aren't people doing it? And then we discovered it's probably because they've been successful not doing it. Why should they bother? But it's, it's up to all of you guys out there to put pressure on the brands to make these boats that you in ways that you really want because unless the pressure comes from the consumers which is everybody like you then you need to put the pressure on the companies to make those boats in the way that you want them made and not settle for second best and certainly there's so many features which are safety issues watertight bulkheads airtight voids adequate numbers of bilge pumps etc Beachability. There are so many features that to me just seem obvious, but so few people do them. So guys, we really hope that this information is useful for you to understand why beaching boats and shallow draft create such a better lifestyle and safety factors if you're sailing. And it can be on monohulls, it can be on catamarans, both can have lifting keels. And I hope that you can understand now why we keep banging on about shallow drafts and beachable boats. So guys, thanks for watching. Hope you've liked the video and um, we really appreciate your support. That's it for us. All the best guys. Bye for now. Bye. Thanks for watching guys. And if you like what we do, show us the love and hit the like button. Then hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell as well. So you don't miss out on your regular fix. Then. Kick off your shoes and you can come barefoot with us. We're really close to the pool, it's in the back, so we've got kids jumping and squealing and carrying on. And there's a crying baby. And there's a crying baby. So, you know, this is the reality of reality programs where nothing is absolutely perfect. So we're just going to push on and if you hear crying babies or screaming kids, screaming kids or any noises outside, it's only going to make you concentrate even more. On the quiet words. On the quiet words we say. <laughs> Thanks for watching and we really appreciate your support. Shepherd, shepherd, shepherd. Really appreciate your support. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even one o'clock. So guys.